today's guest is Michael Stone. He's the owner of Construction Program and Results. So, Michael, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Well, you're more than welcome. We're glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. I mean, I've I've heard a lot of good things from a lot of uh, people about what you do, and um, you've been at this uh, a while. What what um, what made you move from the I think um, construction side to the should I say education side? Yeah, that's a fair way to put it. Oh, it was a matter of a you know um, I was finishing up my four year degree back started in the late eighties. Actually, I started way back in the sixties, but I got back after it in the eighties and then it finished up in the late nineties. And during that time, I had written a small book and on the uh, how to deal with the issues in business management and construction. And our my advisor in college told me, he says, you ought to turn it into a book. And so we did. We turned it into a small booklet and sent it out. And we re- it was a comb, a, a, a comb bomb book. And we were selling a thing. I don't know what it was, but it was called uh, Making the Numbers Work in Construction. And Craftsman Book Company called me and said, we want you to take this book and we want you to add some stuff to it and do this and do that. And I said, sure, OK. So but two, three years later, we got it all done, got it edited, put it out and immediately started getting calls from associations and companies and whoever to start doing educational seminars based on the book. And, and um, uh, so we started doing that and it quickly became evident I could not boo both construction and the educational process. And being the lazy soul that I am, I decided to go the easy way and go with the educational part. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of how we got here. Yeah. So, I mean, from, from the original book that came out, what, what part of the book, because obviously you're covering different aspects, uh, were people uh, sort of getting the most value of or just, you know, um, the, the big educational piece? Well, the, the, at the time, I was told by the editor of the company that wanted to publish a book that how to establish the sales price for your work was the one most in-demand topic of anything that they got from their customers and that was Craftsman Book Company and of course they're the biggest publisher of, the, of books in the construction industry and he said that was the number one demand how to price our work and the in the small book I had written uh, I'm making the numbers work in construction just step by step right through it and so they got a hold of the book and said hey let's you know let's fluff this thing up and and make it work so we did and um so I, you know, I initially I took about a year to rewrite the book and get it to the point where it was ready for them. And then they took about a year to edit it and it came out in January 98 or 99, I forget which. And, you know, and uh, it was kind of interesting. A, a lumber company called me and said, would you do some seminars for our people based on your book? And I said, and it was a local lumber company. They're a big up, but they had like 18 or 19 stores around the area. <clears throat> he said sure so they on a saturday they sent out their invoices for the previous month's materials to all these contractors sent that out at noon on saturday and by tuesday night we had over 300 people that had signed up for the the seminar it was a three-hour seminar i did we had over 300 people that signed up for it and of course once we did that with those seminars over a period of oh, a couple of weeks i did like five seminars and after that the word got out and we just started getting literally bombarded with emails and phone calls people wanting us to go here there or whatever and you know so here we are 465 seminars later <laughs> a one day in length and i've done about another 1200 one two or three hour seminars so you know we've been busy yeah, for sure. Busy. A lot of traveling. <laughs> so when when you um, you know encounter someone that's looking for help on pricing their their uh, projects appropriately, where do you start? Is it the mindset? Is it just sort of exposing them to the and, and laying out the cost? Uh, wh- where does it start with with what you do? Well, you know, I start asking questions immediately. All right, you got your you do your estimate. <clears throat> now we want to get to the sales price. How do you do that? And, you know, it's amazing over half the people that I ask that question to do not have a method of arriving at a sales price. 
a lot of them say, well, I, you know, I, I do the estimate and then I kind of look around and see what everybody else is charging. And that's what I use. And that's a path right out of this business, I'll guarantee you. And so, you know, we figure out what they're doing that's self-destructive and, and that is self-destructive behavior for a contractor. We figure out what they're doing that's self-destructive and, and, and trying to eliminate it and get them on so they have a system and they do the same thing the same way every single time and, and price their jobs correctly. And, and all of a sudden, hey, wow, I made some money on this job. And then, you know, three months later, we get a phone call. I'm paying off all my bills. Yes. You know, so um, yeah. Devin and I have built our business on one principle, and that's helping contractors take care of their families. If that makes any sense at all. And yeah. you know, if they run their business great correctly they'll be able to take care of their families and that's so it all ties together yeah well that's what's most important now yep. uh w- when you run across these contractors on average you know I, I don't know if you track this but what how much um are they under i'm assuming under pricing their services um when when you encounter them? what do you, th- you think roughly the average is you run across oh probably they're they're charging 60 to 70% of what they should. In other words, their sales price is anywhere minimum 15% low to as high as 40 to 50% too low. Okay, the, the average contractor that calls us that wants coaching, on average, they are 125 dollars to $130,000 in debt. That calls us for coaching, not anything else, just strictly, you know, I need help. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and that's... And, and when you start to expose people that, what's the number one objection you get? And what is your response to that? Oh, they, yeah, most common, oh, I can't charge that. I can't charge that. Nobody will pay it in this, in this town. I'm in. And of course, my response is, how the hell do you know? You've never tried it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is one thing I will tell you that, you know, uh, you know, I tell people, you want a friend, go buy a dog. This is business. You ask me, I'm going to give you a straight answer. No BS, no hoorah. And so I'd lay it right on them. And, and, you know, if they listen, we'll keep going. If they don't listen, we're all done talking. I won't waste my time with people that, you know, if they, you know, you, you point out, they say, what am I doing wrong? I point it out to them. They start with the ah, uh uh-uh. Okay. Yeah. I got 60 years in this business. I don't have to listen to you about butts anymore. Maybe 40 years ago, fine, but not today, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, really, I mean, you know, when you've been around as long as I have, and, and, and we've got clients in 43 countries around the world, you know, when you got, you know, that kind of background and expertise, you'd think that, that if a guy's having trouble, he'd want to listen to somebody that's been there and done that. Okay. And then, you know, and, and I've been, I've had the same problems every one of these guys have had when I was in business one time or another, maybe goes back 30 or 40 years, but you know, so for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a mindset. It's a lot of it is um, a lot of the problems we have in this business is that we don't have a good educational system. Um, you know, like, you know, the guys say, well, there's no really good apprenticeships uh, out there anymore. And they're true. They're, that's, the apprenticeships now are a voluntary thing, and a lot of people don't want to put the time and effort into s- sitting under somebody else's thumb, for lack of a better term, for four years and learning how to do a trade. And, and consequently, we've had a real drop off in the number of people getting into this business. And I'm, I'm hoping that it'll turn around a lot of there's some very good guys out there pushing that. But, um, you know, there's the educational system we have in, in the country today, you know, U.S. and Canada, both the, the, the so-called educators, the people have set through a four-year degree or a five-year, six-year degree in a college, and then they're they put out there to teach high school and, and grade school kids, uh, you know, their priority is getting them into college, not into a, a profession that they can take care of themselves and, and take care of their families. And that's unfortunate, but that's one of the reasons we have such a, a, a a low number of people getting into our business today. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, you know, assuming that uh, a, a construction business has the right margins and they're they're moving along, how do you think about headcount and growth? Like, how do you manage that? How do you talk someone through that if they ask you about that? 
as far as growing their company? Yeah, growing a company, when to hire, how to approach it, you know, um, projecting, I mean, assuming that your margins are good, how do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I've talked for years that contractors should, their goal should be no less than an 8% net profit after all said and done. And, and that means that their salary is not profit. And that's one of the big mistakes that a lot of CPAs make. They say, they tell the contractors, oh, no, no, you're, you don't take a salary. Your salary is the profit the company makes. And that's a bunch of horse manure. And I tell contractors, if you got some CPA telling you that, go find another CPA because they're wrong. I mean, you've got to, you've got to put your salary for owning and running the company in your overhead expenses on your profit and loss statement. So, you know, if they maintain the 8% net profit, and then they take a look at where they're at, like at a, a young young guy just getting started, maybe his wife's doing the bookkeeping and stuff for him. Okay, the first thing he needs to do in most cases is get off the jobs, which means he must hire a job foreman, superintendent, lead man, whatever you want to call them, and let them run the jobs. And he sticks with what he does best, which is sell. Okay, and if the wife is or the significant other is, is not competent or doesn't like to do that kind of work then the second person he hires is a good bookkeeper and the most efficient and highly profitable companies in construction right now are a husband and wife or a couple that are committed to each other and a third person who either who does what the owner one of the owners doesn't want to do which is in the in a, if it's a male female combination and the male wants to do the sales, then they hire a superintendent. If, they, if the guy wants to do production, then they hire a salesperson. That three-person combination will get you the highest percentage of profits of any combination of people in construction today. Mm. Okay, And that will be true on new homes or remodeling, either one. Okay, mm. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to do the dollar blame of, of, of some of these great big, um, you know, multi-thousand uh, uh, home builders, uh, guys that build thousands of home a year, you're not going to do the volume or th that they'll do, but you darn sure can make a higher percentage of your profit. And so if you're doing a, a, a good volume of business, a million and a half, $2 million a year, you can make darn good money for all three of you. Mm, okay. That makes sense. Okay, so and I'm, I'm talking six digit incomes, both of them, all three of you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so what you're saying is, you know, if you have a couple or, or two people that, that can cover uh, demand generation, operations, and finance and accounting. Um, that's good. When you grow, you're, you're, you're maintaining, you're, you're able to maintain an 8% net profit. Maybe mm -hmm. you pool some money uh, while doing that, create a bit of a, a, a sort of a, a war chest, <clears throat> and then you can hire a third person that could sort of optimize, take everything to the next level, or do things that people were doing but they don't necessarily like it or are the best at it. And then that's the core of what you build against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that you said, you know, hire a war chest or whatever, that's what we call an operating capital reserve account. And that's the other thing that a lot of contractors don't do, which is to set money aside off of every paycheck or any check in the door, you know, between one and 4% of that check should go in a, a, a separate account someplace and be set aside until the company has a minimum uh, probably five or six months worth of overhead and maybe as high as a year's worth of overhead set aside. And then when these flip-flops and downturns and pandemics and all this other monkey motion come along, you don't have to worry about it because your bills are paid. If you can't go out and see a customer for two months, like up where you are, you have the government shut everybody down. If that happens, your bills are still paid. You don't have to worry and fuss about it. Hell, go fishing, whatever you want to do. Okay. But a lot of contractors don't do that. And then when when things get tough, you know, the uh, leads dry up or they have a pandemic or whatever it is, they end up going out of business because they don't have money to pay the overhead. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and, I, it, and, and it's not necessary. I mean, they do that. They made a choice to do that. They didn't have to do that. With the operating capital reserve account, That all those problems go away. Yeah. And I'm assuming, you know, the way that you're describing things, uh, you know, a lot of business owners, they manage their business using the top line, not looking at the bottom line and what it costs to get, get that revenue in the bottom line. Is that the case? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, the good ones know and understand 
a profit and loss statement. And there's, there's a number of places you can go to learn how to do that. I, you know, a lot of guys talk about the balance sheet, but you know, balance sheet is good for the overall picture. I want to know about today. And that's what the profit and loss statement will talk, talk to you about. And it, and it, and it brings up, you know, where you should be focusing your attention. And if you, if you've, do what you should do each day, then it, the overall big picture takes care of itself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you probably see this a lot. So, you know, yeah. Okay. So oh, that's great. Um, what, what are, what are other common areas people ask you on um, that within the construction business? Um, sales, a yeah. lot of sales either. And I work, you know, as a remodeling salesperson, I work selling new homes, I've sold uh, electrical work, plumbing work, uh, painting work, and roofing work for different contractors at different times. So I've got a pretty good background in sales. And in fact, we wrote a book called Profitable Sales, a Contractor's Guide. And what I essentially did is a third of that book is all the problems that a, that a salesperson is going to run to when they're out there. As an example, you got a sales call, somebody go push on the door and they open the door and they're standing there in their underwear. You know, what do you do? You know, especially if it's some of the opposite sex, you know, I mean, some people just, you know, they shake their head, they can't figure this stuff out. But, you know, those kind of things, uh, they, they show, they open the door and, you know, they've got a, a, a joint in one, one hand and, and a, you know, a glass of whiskey in the other. What do you do? Those are things that are going to happen. If you're in sales more than a week, you're going to start running into that stuff. And you need to have thought out ahead of time what you're going to do. You know, as an example, if they show up and they have little or no clothes on, you say, oh, excuse me, tell you what, I'll be back in five minutes, give you a chance to get yourself together. And then we'll, we'll start talking about your job. And don't even ask them if that's okay. You just turn around, go back in your car, and drive around the block two or three times and come back, you know, because most people, not all, but most people figured out that you're uncomfortable with that situation and they need something done on their home or building and you know, they'll get some clothes on and be ready to talk to you. Yeah. Well, you, know? you mentioned all, all different uh, industries like, you know, roofing and, and, you know, painting and all that stuff, but it, is the sales process or some of the tactics, is, is there any differences you noticed in between all those things you've done or are there sort of common themes that you, you go back to? Um, I, and, you know, I can go out and, and anybody call me, I can go out and sell for them. I don't care what they have. The only difference is the materials you use. It's something to think about the process is exactly the same they've got to decide that they like you that they want you to do their work and then it's up to you to convince them that you can do the work okay and you're gonna be fair with them and charge them a fair price it doesn't change at least at least doesn't to me you know yeah and yeah that that sales book is has uh, turned a lot of companies around and they're they're you know they they get rid of the yeah buts and they just go do it you know and, and there's there's so much misinformation and old ghosts and myths and stuff that that fly around this industry that people don't stop and think it through you know oh the customer will never pay that how do you know you never tried okay you know so yeah it, it's a matter of of educating, I think a lot of us educating themselves, you know, what can or can't be done or what should or shouldn't be done. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Now, how does, um, how does marketing fit into the equation? Well, the, 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 if you, you've asked a couple of times about some of the problems that contractors have, one of the biggest ones is guys say, well, we work by referral. That's the biggest bunch of horse manure I've ever heard. Okay, you don't work by referral. If you, if you do, you're not going to be in business long. Why? Because those referrals, unless you've got a darn good program in place that you tell the referring people exactly what type of leads you want and, and what type of you know, work you do and what kind of leads you want and what kind of people you want to say, which almost no contractor does, then you're taking whatever's coming in. I mean, you may get a call one day for a new home. You may get a call the next day for a kitchen remodel. You may get a call the next day for a roofing. Well, come on, you can't do all that stuff and do be efficient at it. You know, you, so this is why you need to figure out who your ideal customer is. And then you develop your, your ideal, your ideal job, if you will. Okay. I want to do kitchen remodels. That's all I want to do. All right. So I figure out who wants to buy kitchens. 
right? And then I develop an ad that says, this is my ideal job. This is a, I'm, I am the best in the world at this job here. And you want a kitchen. Now the secret becomes, how do I promote myself or advertise myself so that my ideal customer wants my ideal kitchen? And once you get that done, your, your leads start coming in. Um, we got a guy that helps our, our contractors. We refer people to him. And you work with him for six months and you're going to be getting three to five leads a, a week in your into your company. And that's right now is the best way to get uh, business in the door is through your, your website. And we have a number of coaching clients that have been with Brian close to a year now and they get in three to five leads a day. They, there, there are very few companies in the U.S. that can handle three to five leads a day. I would bet you could count them on your both hands. That's about all. It's just too much. But the, the upside to that is it gives you the ability to pick and choose who you want to go see. And you also have to develop then the ability to tell people thanks, but no thanks. You know. Mm. Now, now you said uh, you work with someone that provides uh, leads for companies. Is that you know SEO help? Is that at driving yeah. ads? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's Brian Javelin. He's out of roughly Miami, Florida. He lives a little north of there, up by Fort Lauderdale. But the, I, I've known the guy for 13 years now, and he's the best I've ever seen. I mean, he just just does a marvelous job. But the the point going back to your question about referrals and stuff like that, you know, you you you've got to take control of the marketing for your company. You can't leave it to chance, and that's working by referral from other people. You're leaving things to chance. What happens if nobody refers you? What are you going to do? You've got, to, you don't have any work. And by then, if you're in a good marketing program, it takes three to six months to get up and get going. Um, how many guys have got you know their operating capital reserve account set up so that they can go three to six months without any leads in the door and then pick it back up and keep going? Very, very few contractors can do that. So this, this stuff all ties together and, you know, you've got to have a good marketing program in place. If you don't, you're probably not going to survive in this business. Interesting. Now you talked about salespeople and I'm wondering what your, your thoughts are on this. How important do you think financial literacy is for salespeople? Um, all right. So you're, in other words, it, are you asking if the, the, the salespeople need to know how to get financing for their customers? No, maybe not. You know, I guess the salespeople don't price the job, so maybe they do lead in. But maybe uh, I'm just curious on how much um, the salespeople would need to know about finance or profitability of a job and stuff like that. Um, you well, know, is it the estimator's role, or I'm just really trying to understand that that aspect. Okay. Well, first thing, the the estimator salesperson should be one and the same. I don't believe in hiring an estimator and then hiring a salespeople. That's okay. As duplication of efforts not needed, right? So if the estimator salesperson, uh, number one, they should know, um, they should know how to provide financing for their customers. I mean, I don't care what they're doing; they should be able to arrange, help the customer get financing, and that's and that will increase their sales right there about twenty percent a year. Okay. Now, as far as their knowledge of the company finances, um, they should know, you know, how to calculate the markup and for the company and they should also know what the numbers are for the company because they should be getting getting a report on every job they do a job costing report on every job they do so they can keep their and the job costing report isn't to you know check how much money the boss is making that's not it what it is it gives you a report on how good a job you're doing of estimating and how good your numbers in your estimating databases are Okay, so if you keep those up to date, it gives you a chance of doing a very good job of estimating. And, and of course, then your job cost reports come back and they're in good shape and the company makes money and you make money. Okay, yeah. so it all ties, again, it all ties right together. Wonderful. Now, there's yeah. a lot of um, new things emerging, with technology and stuff like that. What sort of trends or things that are you really interested about are tracking uh, in the industry? Oh, I think that I think that the uh, boy, there's there's so many things going on. The a company doesn't need to. I think one of the mistakes a lot of companies make is they start paying lots and lots and lots of money out for for software programs, especially stuff in the cloud. 
Um, I don't, you know, I think that's a waste of money. I really do. Because you, you know, we have an estimating program that, you know, we sell as is, you know, it's not in the cloud, it doesn't need to be. Um, uh, we've got a new job costing program coming out and that's also going to be a small, you know, very, very simple program that people can buy from us and do their job costing on. Uh, this cloud stuff just runs the price of your uh, cost of your overhead up. You stop, you think about it. anything you put in the cloud, so to speak, uh, they're going to charge you for it, and they'll charge you every month. And I just have a real tough time with that because I, you know, I've been at this so many years. I was in this business before computers came out. Small, you know, desktop computers way back when. <laughs> guys, the little side note guys, you tell me, oh, you just, you got to have mobile phones. You can't do this business without them. And I say, that's BS. I was in this business 35 years before mobile phones were invented. And we got along just fine without them. You know, they're convenient. They're nice to have, but they're not absolutely necessary. It's amazing how many people don't understand that. But as far as, as trends go, um, you know, you got to keep your, your estimating program and your job costing up, um, uh, good word processing so you can prepare your, your contracts and things like that. Uh, as far as, and you also need to have a program in place to bring on new people and get them trained. Okay. And, and here's another thing a lot of contractors don't do. They don't write down a good job description and for the, for the position that they want filled. So when they advertise, it's kind of loosey-goosey, you know, like money and bad news are all over the place. Uh, so, you, you know, you need, to, you need to really solidify exactly what you're looking for. So when you go advertising for somebody, and then you need to have a game plan in place so you can take them step-by-step step through the process that they will need to go through to learn the job that you want them to do. Okay. Yeah. Another another side note is that uh, you know the the hiring process. A lot of contractors, you know, they don't do a good job of hiring, uh, especially when they uh, when you know, somebody's sitting in front of you and, and well, I used to have my own business. Well, if you're so good and you want me to hire you, you tell me what you did wrong in your business. That's why you're out of business now. And that's the guys don't ask those questions. And I'm saying why. Sales, somebody comes in to, to, to wants a, uh, I want to hire a salesperson. So somebody comes in and applies for the job. And what contractors forget is that salesperson isn't working for the, the, the guy that they were working for or doesn't want to stay with the guy he's working for because either the salesperson of the company has problems and they're not being dealt with. And so now he comes to work for me and now I've got to deal with those problems. So this, the, what I'm, I guess where I'm going with this is that the contractors need to ask a lot more questions when they hire people. Uh, the, the, the best saying I have is be slow to hire and quick to fire. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm on, I, my, I hope I'm answering your question here. But yeah, yeah. Well, you, you touched on something interesting. I just want to um, uh, mention is um, you talked about some sort of onboarding, like programs to train. What, what, in your opinion, what do those programs need to look like? It sounds like an onboarding program for new employees or new uh, workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you need to write out, all right, what's, we want this guy to be able to do what? Okay, you want him to be able to do A, X, Y, and Z, all right? So now we got to back all the way up, all right? Let's take him through steps A, B, C, D, right on down the road so that when we get done training him, he can do all those things out here at this end. But it has to be written down. Guys say, oh, I got it up here. Uh-uh, no, you don't. We just got a head full of mush up here. Put it on paper. You know, a goal isn't a goal until it's in paper and you can see it. Other than that, it's a daydream. And then, you know, there's no nice, what is that? And so this applies also when you're hiring people, you've got to put it down on paper so you can see it. Now you've got a goal and now you can fit somebody in. If you take what you have, bring them in and teach them what you want them to know. You Now you've got a trained employee that, that can produce and make a profit for you. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of guys don't think that. You think, oh, I can do it out of my head. No, you can't. I've never met a human being yet that could do that. Not one. <laughs> Yeah, so um, w when you're not uh, helping contractors get their business up and uh, running and more profitable, what do you do, oh, Michael? You have any hobbies? Oh yeah, um, you can see right back over there is my fly tying bench. Oh. I tie flies for fishing, and right now I am restoring a 1910 Bond drag saw, which is 
um, you know, it's a pile of rust and, and broken pieces and whatever, and I'm going to put it all back together and make it run. And if you want to know what a drag saw is, just get on YouTube and just type in drag saw and you'll see all kinds of them. But um, they're, you know, it probably weighs 350, 400 pounds and it's, you know, cast iron and, and it's been terribly abused. It's been brazed and rebrazed and reworked and, uh, you know, I just, well, I've had it since I owned this place 16 years and I finally got tired of tripping over it. So I'm going to fix this thing and make it work, you know, plus the fact I need something to, to saw my, my firewood from my shop. That's how I heat my shop is firewood in the wintertime. And, and uh, I needed a drag. So I don't under just sawing logs. It's not my thing. I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, I'm lazy. So yeah, it's uh, fly tying. And, and, uh, you know, I like to go down to um, my son has a boat down on, um, uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico there near Corpus Christi and we'll go down there and go out fishing on the on the Gulf fly fishing for redfish or or sea trout or you know that kind of stuff and so yeah that's what I kind of do and then I do a lot of reading I've read 35 or 36 books already this year so wow. you know that's I keep busy yeah I mean I, I have to ask because you're reading a lot of books a year I mean what are some of the ones that really stick out that you've read over the last uh, you know couple of years Oh, most of the stuff I read are, are uh, here. Here's one right here. I can show it to you. It's uh, that frog, Brian Tracy. <laughs> yep, go. that's it. Got it. Um, I've got a whole bunch of them here. I got. I keep most of them in the house because I do most of my reading in the house. Most of the stuff I have is on business management and, you know, and I try to stick to guys that I know, they know what the hell they're doing. You know, Brian Tracy's one. I love his work. The guy, and if you know anything, if, if you ever anything about Brian Tracy, boy, there's a classic case of somebody that's just taken himself from an absolute disaster and now being at what I would call a world-class trainer. I mean, he, you know, he, he talks to something like a quarter of a million people a year in his classes, you know, I don't know, he's a little bit younger than me, but uh, so I'm sure he's gonna be thinking about retiring before too long, but um, you know, Zig Ziglar, you know, died a couple of years ago. He was very good, I loved, I got all his books. Um, you know, Dennis Waitley, Tony Robbins. Um, so you get good business management, but also get a little kick in the butt at the same time, you know. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm just, yeah, I'm one of those guys that needs, uh, I need a, you know, somebody behind me just doing this, you know, a little bit of bump, a little bit of push, you know, you don't have to drag me out of bed in the morning, I'll do that on my own, but, but you also, everybody needs a little direction, a little help, you know, so, yeah. Well, that yeah. makes sense. Well, Michael, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, sharing your story and your insight mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I look forward to hopefully uh, that restoration. Um, hopefully, you, you post that on social or somewhere so we can see what what you did there. Oh uh, yeah, we we've, we've also we're I'm in, in the process right now of writing a book on developing a system for estimating, hmm. not how to do the estimate itself, but a system to put in place so that you can start from square one, going out, see the customer, gather the information, and sit down and do an estimate, step by step, how to do that. And there's nothing on the market like it. And I'm probably a little over about 50, 60% of the way done with it. And I was working on that before we talked this morning. But I'm looking forward to getting that one done too, so I can get back to working on my drag saw. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much, and, Michael. 